And tonight on The Wrap, did Latunza drop the ball, allowing a stressed-out pilot to fly? Did John Kerry open Pandora's box with a possible nuke agreement with Iran? Plus potluck, yay or nay, and more. It's time for The Daily Wrap. And welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Joe Concha, along with my co-host Rick Unger, who was originally slated to play Thurston Howell on Gilligan's Island you before what out. a hand gliding yeah. accident sidelined him a day before production began. What it are the odds on one that? One of the great disappointments of my life. Wow, it is. you would have yeah. been so much better as I know. Lovey's husband. You didn't stand in for uh, Mrs. Howell. I could have been Mr. Magoo too. <laughs> well, we'll learn more about that as we go into yay or nay. In the meantime, joining us tonight, she is the co-host of Close Encounter. Lisa Jandovitz is here. Never tried out for any Gilligan's Island part, as far as we know. And he is a former SEAL and FBI agent. Jonathan Gilliam is back. Not to be confused, but Gilligan is back on the show. Welcome all. It's time for the Daily Download. So today, prosecutors announcing that the co-pilot responsible for purposely crashing German Wings pilot a flight, excuse me, 9525, killing all on board, had a medical condition he hid from his employer. When searching Andreas Lubitz's home, prosecutors did not find a suicide note, but did find a doctor's note excusing him from work on the day of the crash. As you can imagine, the co-pilot's mental state is the focus of the investigation. Should he have been flying? Should German Wings management have grounded the pilot? What was going on in the pilot's head? Earlier today, our own Steve Malzberg had a chance to speak to America's psychologist, Dr. Jeffrey Gardier. Yes, it was a mass murder, but at the same time, this is someone who wanted to kill himself, right. but not in a way that was private, in a way that was selfish, in a way that hurt so right. many people. Steve and Dr. Gardier continued. In this particular case, this is someone who had more than a depression. Depressed people don't kill other people. Depressed people end up hurting themselves many times. So this was a, 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 a situation of someone who had some sort of a, a severe personality disorder and maybe even some psychosis going on. Steve then asked Dr. Gardier how easy it is to hide mental illness. Can you fool the world and then just do something like this? Well, this may have been someone who was not only fooling the world, but fooling himself and being in denial as to how serious his issues were. And then he imploded, uh, regrettably, uh, horrifically, took out 149 other people with him. It's, it's pretty scary stuff. Mental illness is not some small problem. Look at these stats from the National Alliance of Mental Illness, or on mental illness. One in four adults, approximately 61 0.5 million Americans, soak in that number for a moment, experience mental illness in a given year. One in 17, about 13.6 million live with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia, mental de uh, major depression, or bipolar disorder. 13 and a half million people have a major mental illness. So based on those stats, some have to be pilots, bus drivers, or any other position that requires being responsible for the safety of other people. Rick Latunza knew this guy had a problem. They let him become a pilot in any way. Could this have been prevented, I think, is the question. You know what? I, I got to be honest. I'm very uncomfortable with the way the story is developing amongst all the media. We don't know. We have no idea. Now, there are certain clues that we're getting, uh, but, you know, I, I hear them all talking about the doctor's note. Well, you know, I got a doctor's note not to go to work because I had the flu. So, you know, we really need to know what that problem was. What I don't understand, while everybody's getting all excited about this new piece of evidence, why didn't anybody call the doctor? And say what was wrong right. with this They're not guy? Revealing what was in that? Yeah, what was I mean, in that we note. don't we don't know enough to be leaping to the conclusions we're but leaping I, to. But I think, and we spoke about this earlier. I think a big reason that people are leaping forward is because the fear that most of us have. We were talking about this in terms of flying. Mm -hmm. Every one of us that gets on a plane. We're giving up control to whoever is is in control of that plane. Those pilots, and to feel that. Gee, it's unknown. As you can have somebody there with such a serious problem, mental mental illness, that is in control, and and something like this can happen. We want to make sure that it, it can happen in this country. I'm willing to bet that the next time all of us fly, maybe not you, Jonathan. You're a little more braver than we are. <laughs> but it's the first thing you think of. You're going to walk through mm -hmm. when when you go down the tarmac and you walk into the plane. You're looking into the cabin. You're going to wonder, can I trust this guy or right. girl? 
Right, John? That's absolutely true. And, and unfortunately, there's no policy in place for how they screen pilots. Some places will do a preliminary psychological evaluation, but long term, there's no psychological evaluations that happen again and again. And I think, you know, one of the, the biggest things that we're facing, whether it be gun control or now we're talking about pilots, is that mental illness. You know, back in the day, I'll finish that, uh, that thought, but back in the day, you know, the plague was killing everybody. And then they came out with uh, basically some, a shot that you could take and then, you know, now you're treated right. for that, all right? There's no, and, and so we don't take the plague serious anymore, right? Why, why aren't we doing that with mental illness? All these people, you know, we should start looking at mental illness seriously and saying, hey, listen, it's okay if you have these types of things. It's better that you tell us and we deal with it than you go and crash a plane and kill 150 people. Right. You know but, what, Joe, also, the, the, the thing is there was something there during his training. We sure. don't know how significant, but there was a type of a red flag in that he stopped training because whether they say he was going through depression or he was burned out, and so do you think, though, that every airline should then say, I'm seeing a, a mental problem here. It, 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 it degrees mean something, mm -hmm. of course. But, you know, you may suffer from a little depression. Sorry, you can't take this job. Not a little depression, though. There was a reason that he stopped, and I think that need to, needed to be looked at. There was a reason that his training was well, stopped. I don't mean him a little depression. Oh. I wonder what the level, where, where that line is, where you right, could say right. you're allowed to fly a plane where you're responsible for 150, 200 people, or you're not. Right, and, and he flew for over 100 hours, so. It, it, they so closely watch the medication that pilots take that if you take if you're sick and you take certain medications you can't fly right. why isn't it the case that you know that all these and you the question that Rick asked is why is this is being reported in the media one of the things that's definitely coming out as I watch all these pilots talk is that they are desperately trying to keep any overwatch from happening and I understand that but at the same time you know they say well this doesn't happen often enough if it happens once 150 people are killed if a bus driver from New York City is not feeling good and he crashes his bus, you're going to have 20 people have headaches because they have a concussion. Well, or they could be killed, they, but I they take could be, point. but you know, you see. Here, here are some stats that I think you'll find interesting. FAA report uh, from 2014. Eight in 2,758 fatal aviation accidents between 2003 and 2012 were suicides. All right. Interesting. So think about that. Eight in 2,800, we'll yeah. call it. Right? right. Boy, so... I just wonder, to Rick's point, do we overreact in these situations? I get you should reform to a certain mm -hmm. extent, mm -hmm. but you, you said it yesterday, and it sounds cold in a certain to extent, but sometimes you can't prevent things. You Stuff can't. happens. I'm going to break in because the reason I've been looking okay. at my screen is there's breaking news. Amanda Knox's uh, murder conviction has been overturned by an Italian court. So let's talk about that more when we get back. Amanda Knox's <laughs> guilty verdict overturned. Interesting. We'll talk about that in a moment. This is The Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax. And welcome back to Daily Wrap. I'm Joe Concha, along with my partner, Rick Unger, along with Lisa Jandovitz and Jonathan Gilliam. Before we get to news about Secretary of State John Kerry in Geneva and the talks around Iranian nuke uh, negotiations, uh, Rick Unger does have some breaking news that just came to us a couple of minutes ago regarding Amanda Knox, Mr. Unger, a we, lawyer. We are learning that uh, Amanda Knox's case was, was heard. We know it was on appeal um, for the second time. She's, she's actually been like a ping pong ball. She was convicted, it was upheld, then it was her conviction was set aside, then an appeals court said no guilty anyhow this has been going back and forth well this was the highest case and they have overturned her conviction they have also overturned the conviction of her uh, co-defendant who was her boyfriend Rafael Solicito so as it stands right now they're both in good shape however it does go back to yet another court where this could actually happen again. This is the Italian Another legal Italian system. Another Italian court, it goes back to It goes to, back so. to the Italian court where theoretically they could yet again retry it and rehear it. I don't think that's likely. But she served time though in she Italy. She did, she served four years, yes. But is she, okay. so explain to the viewers, because even I'm getting confused. Right. Is she now, right now when they free. overturned it and they said that she's not guilty? She's free. Because I already thought she was found not guilty. She she was, and then a court, after she had oh, already come correct. back to the U.S., they retried it. She right. was found guilty in abstention, and was that's what here. was being appealed. So right. they obviously don't have the same law that we do, that once you're found they not don't guilty, have double, double jeopardy. jeopardy. Not, right, they right. don't have double jeopardy. So how about this scenario? Points. She comes back here, starts a life. 
Italy calls and said, right. we want you back. They would have to commence extradition proceedings. Right. And it would be very, very tricky because it's unlikely in this particular case that the U.S. government would be willing to play ball. Right. So Because of our own law has, around double jeopardy. Yeah, and, so and wait a minute. And our government has to agree to extradite her. They, you know, they can't just come and get her. And I think, you know, given that she, that she was tried a few times, mm -hmm. she's been found not guilty even prior to this appeal, I don't think we would have extradited her. That's interesting. Well, for, I, I'm happy just for the fact that we'll never have to wor hear these two words ever again. Or maybe we will. We may. Foxy Noxy. Yeah. <laughs> worst, about that. worst nickname ever. Do you think she, maybe killed, she may have killed somebody. Let's right. call her Foxy. Maybe you're the last right. person to ever say it. I no, I don't feel that. like that's think? not the case. Not not at all. And she really isn't that foxy. Anyway. Oh, that's not nice. Well, I'm just saying. She's free. She's happy. <laughs> she's got a mom sure and a relieved. dad. Come on. Anyway, they think she is. Secretary of State John Kerry in Geneva trying to come to some sort of agreement with Iran regarding its nuclear program. By the White House self-imposed deadline, Mr. Kerry was asked, what would happen if he is unable to come to a deal with Iran? Iran would have the ability to go right back spinning its centrifuges and enriching to the degree they want, if they want, if that's what they choose. And the sanctions will not hold, because those other people who deem the plan to be reasonable will walk away and say, you do your thing, we'll do ours. I would think somebody married to Teresa Hines would have more than one tie. It's the same <laughs> light blue long... Every day. Every day. He's like that Yahoo. He wears yeah. the same tie. Every day. Every day. Speaking of yeah. which, Secretary <laughs> Kerry then directed the next comments squarely at the GOP and the aforementioned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Anybody standing up in opposition to this has an obligation to stand up and put a viable, realistic alternative on the table. And I have yet to see anybody do that. And the Washington Free Beacon is reporting that, quote, U.S. negotiators are said to have given up ground on demands that Iran be forced to disclose the full range of its nuclear activities at the outset of a nuclear deal. A concession experts say would gut the verification the Obama administration has vowed would stand as the crux of a deal with Iran. That's not a big deal or anything. Jonathan Gilliam, let's start with you. If we can't trust and verify, then what's the point of even signing a deal in the first place? I, I, the whole thing about negotiating with Iran is like saying to a bully, you know, at school, we'll let you carry brass knuckles, okay, um, but don't hit anybody with them, you know. I mean, the the foreign policy, in, in, as a you know, as it goes to Iran in these negotiations, should be this, you know, because of their record and because of who they are and their stances across the board, we should just say, listen. You're not going to have anything nuclear, and if you try to do it, then we're going to eliminate your your entire um, you know administration. I mean, wh what what else are you going to do right. with these guys? You uh, think eliminate that, their entire administration by force? I guess that's the only way you could probably. Do that's that, the only right? way you could do it. But the, the reality is, they only understand force. And in, in a country like that, if they get nuclear weapons, they're going to use force. There's just no doubt about it. Well, they did say they want to wipe Israel off. Yeah, the they did. Say I that. don't understand how the talks can continue if they're failing to divulge whether they had previously ever, you know, had nuclear uh, weapons or, or attempted to build them. How can you continue if if they're not being forthright and? Well, as a world uh, power, how can you allow people to have nuclear weapons if they say they want to wipe a country off the? Earth. Mm -hmm. Rick, here's my question. It, we seem to have the right. leverage, I would think, because Iran's economy is in trouble. They want these sanctions lifted so they can get healthy again. Right. And we seem to be giving up everything uh, just to beat this deadline well, that no one cares about. Yeah, again, I, I'm going to point out what I consistently point out is we don't really know. We just keep hearing these rumors. We'll know, I think, next week. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a very strange scenario going on. I actually agree with, with Carrie on the first part. I haven't heard people propose viable options. However, if this latest rumor is true and they're not going to be forced to disclose all of their nuclear or, or whatever you want to call them locations, well, right, it's absurd. Right. It means we can't possibly monitor them because we don't even know where they all are. I, so, yes, I would have to say if they're trying to force that as part of the deal, there can be no deal. But we have to wait and see. Making this even crazier is what's going on in Yemen right now, mm -hmm. where we are now lined up with the other Arab states against Iran. This has become a proxy war. Iran is supporting the Houthi and, uh, Shias right. who are trying to take over the government. That would not be good for us mm -hmm. because you'll see al-Qaeda on the peninsula mm -hmm. moving right in, and Iran is backing them. And the rest of us are against them. And to Crete, 
It's U.S. forces yeah. with, with Iranian Iran. forces, right. Right. and and Shia it, there as well, taking on Sunnis, basically ISIS. It's it's, it's nuts. It's this insane. is, and no offense to you guys that have a law degrees, but this is where <laughs> being you know lawyers step in and uh, executives that don't have enough experience to make these decisions, they step in and they make you know it, the tail does not know what the head is doing, and it, everything is completely you know out of whack. Know. It's just out of whack. I don't think that I think this group knows about what's going on in Yemen. That group may know what's going on in Iran, but none of them are thinking realistically. They're thinking legally, and well, that is a really completely different I, I'm thing. I'm actually going to go further for you. You'll like this. I don't think it's a question of legal or, or that. I think it's a question of there's no denying a very failed foreign policy go in the Middle East. And what do, last word, going, what do you think is going to happen though with the deal? Do you don't think it may not happen at all? I have a feeling that's going to be the outcome. Not that, at that, that this thing is just going to break down because maybe the U.S. will finally show some backbone right. and say that's too much you're asking you're for. You're not going to have a choice. Coming up next, wait till you hear what a school principal made a seven-year-old student do. It's outrageous. This is the Daily Wrap.